I'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Apologies if anyone tried to log in uh, last week a little bit late. I, I uh, was on the call and I don't know about 10 minutes in, no one had appeared. So I went ahead and disappeared. <laughs> so <laughs> um, anyway, nice to be here. I was reflecting this morning on, well, I have been really the last couple of days on uh, sometimes the stuff that I'm presenting, the perspective you could say that I'm presenting, um, I think it can get, we can lose sight of, of, of something um, related to it. And that is just how 180 degrees different it is than we could say, you know, our consensus reality, if you will. Um, sometimes I, I characterize those two different perspectives as the described world or the interpreted world and the world of, of um, whatever it is that the descriptions and the interpretations are attempting to um, render or uh, make sense of, if you will. Um, and so I was reflecting on, on, on that 180 degrees and I just wanted to share a little bit about just to kind of highlight just how distinct it is. And yet, despite being that distinct, these two perspectives, if you will, and I often talk about it as perspectives, um, it's actually the same one reality that can show up <laughs> in both ways, which is quite wild. It's not really two worlds, it's just a singular reality here. Um, but the difference of those perspectives is quite marked and, and really brings with it a whole different feel, a whole different sense, a whole different um, set of implications, you could say, for the what we think of as our life, as our human existence. Um, so within the realm of, you know, if you will, consensus reality, the interpreted, described world that we seem to be living in and kind of take for granted that it is the case based on our descriptions and our c concepts about it. Um, we imagine that the world is made of things, separate things, pieces, parts, right? I mean, and, 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 and if it's not apparent, this consensus view, if you will, of, of what's going on here is just, you know, it's more or less unquestioned by the, the, the preponderance of, of us, of, of humans. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so this consensus view is that the world is made of pieces and things that are separate from each other. But if we feel experience, and I'm always saying this like a broken record, if you just feel, if you will, the field of experience that's here, that's present, what's happening, you actually don't find pieces, not experientially you find a whole. Certainly shows up as what we could call pieces and parts. So, I mean, that one distinction between those two perspectives is, can't be um, emphasized enough. It's, it's probably the, the, the heart of it all, that one distinction. Um, of course, in the consensus view of things, the interpreted world, um, says that there's these pieces <laughs> that we believe exist, these parts can influence one another, that this can have an influence on that. In other words, the whole world of cause and effect, one thing affecting another thing. And that sense of cause and effect of the pieces uh, where for the human that shows up, you know, particularly in a pronounced way is the sense of being a part called a self in a world of, of non-self pieces and parts, in other words, the other, the world. So being a self, being a subject in a world of, of, other, of otherness, of objects. So, and we feel and we believe from this interpreted perspective that as a separate piece or part, we are vulnerable to the other pieces and parts, whether those are external to us seemingly or 
internal to us as, as states of mind, as emotions and so on. We, we feel, or the, the conven- consensus sort of view is that I'm a self having these experiences, these other things that are occurring to me, one part having an effect on another part. But from the, again, from the perspective of experience, which is beyond description, if we just feel into the presence of it right now, with no pieces and parts, there's no cause and effect. There's not one thing affecting another thing. There's just one thing. There's not one piece influencing another piece. There's not one piece uh, that's, say, a self or a subject that is subject to the impact of another piece. In other words, vulnerable to the influence and the impact and the the force of some other piece. That is all from the perspective of there actually being pieces. And this other perspective, the, the you could say pure experience, experience outside of the, the frames of reference that we bring to it, you can't find pieces. And where is their vulnerability? There's complete invulnerability. Because vulnerability rests upon one thing having an effect on another thing. So this is invulnerable. It can't be harmed. And we could say indestructible. There's not one thing that can destroy another thing. There's just one thing. One field of experiencing. Consensus reality, um, the view of consensus reality, if you will, uh, is that the pieces and the things in the world itself is bounded and limited. And we are as well as a, as a, as a separate piece of reality, we are bounded and limited. Um, but again, from the experiential perspective of this seamless whole, there's no boundary, there is no limitation, there's no definition, there's no description. So, so reality from that perspective completely radically transcends all those, all those notions of separation of division, of vulnerability and destructibility. So just feel, feel that, feel the way in which experience itself is inviolable. It's extraordinary. There's not something outside of experience to diminish experience, to violate it, to harm it. There's nothing outside of experience. If you found something outside of experience, that would be more experience. So there's nothing outside of experience from this perspective that I'm speaking about. From another perspective, there's there's a world outside of our subjective experience. And again, that's kind of a consensus view of things. And I'm offering up another perspective, which is not the only perspective, but it is one, I think, with uh, that can be felt and, and, and experienced and known, and that brings with it, as I said, a different set of um, implications, if you will, for the human. I'm related to everything that I've been saying. Um, another way of <clears throat> understanding this radical distinction, this 180 degree distinction, is that f- based on how the world is described, kind of, again, consensus descriptions and interpretations of things. Problems exist. Imperfections exist. Lack exists. And these things, there's there's then the understandable impulse to try to correct those apparent problems and imperfections and lack. But problems rest upon the way we are defining things. And from the perspective of experience itself, which doesn't collapse into a definition, there are no problems. There are no imperfections. There's no lack. This is completely full, completely whole. What, what, What could it be lacking? It is everything. So it can't be lacking anything. Uh, 
another distinction that I often highlight between the described world as it's described conventionally, if you will, and the indescribed world of experience, indescribable world of experience, is that our descriptions suggest that the phenomena that are arising, the appearances that are here, all of this stuff, the stuff of life, has a kind of stability to it, uh, an endurance, a, um, a continuity to it. But if you feel your experience right now, you can quickly see it doesn't require much time <laughs> to notice that experience is not holding still, is not stable, is not continuous, it's discontinuous, it would seem. I mean, we've only been together here for a few minutes and what happened to all the experience that you were having <laughs> over the last 12 minutes? It's all gone, evaporated, dissolved. So in a very real sense, our, our own identity as the field of experience is constantly dissolving and then arising as the next instant, you could say, being born as the next version of itself. This seamless whole dancing as all of this diversity and dif differentiation and, I mean, it's incredible, the diversity that shows up, the apparent diversity. And yet all of it is of this same uh, fathomless, indescribable, ungraspable stuff. It's not really stuff, it's, cause it's not a thing, but um, reality of experience is so impermanent. It's so, it's so non-durational that in a way, I, I was reflecting on this the other day that we could say in a sense, and you'll hear different traditions talk about it in this way, that never, nothing ever really comes into complete form, even though it absolutely seems like it does. But this idea of that something becomes something, resolves as being something solid and fixed and definable is again, how we, imagine as, as humans, reality is kind of structured in that way, that things have stability and continuity over time, but, but experience contradicts that, deviates from that interpretation. And if you look at experience, if you feel into your experience right now, you can see that it's not stable. It's not holding still. It's just absolutely gone. It's like this pointless point. Like, when is experience actually occurring? I mean, again, conventionally speaking, that perspective, we have this sense of time being stre stretched out, right? The passage of time stretched out, spread out over time. But the actual felt sense of experience is just this flash without duration. It's just like a pointless point. It's just like that. And it shows up though, as this spread out <laughs> panorama of the passage of time and history. And that's what it looks like. But we've never experienced time in a very real sense, even though again, it's just a agreed upon conventional view that time exists and space exists. But we never experience anything other than this flash. We've never experienced something called a past, never experienced something called the future. Where, where are those? They're happening in this, this immediacy. And this immediacy very strangely is literally the emergence of it, the apparent arising of it is its, um, is its vanishing. It's like it's in this constant process of seemingly becoming, but never quite becoming, because that would suggest something stable and solid and fixed. Now it's become, it's taken birth and here's what it looks like. I mean, each of us took birth as humans, but from the very instant of our birth, we were never the same in any instant, even if it looked like it, you know? If you, 
It looked at short periods of time. You know, it looked like, you know, at, at one hour old, you know, Pam was more or less the same that she was at two hours old, you know? What you wouldn't say that, but no, Pam was entirely different <laughs> as, a, as a form of reality, um, any of us, of course. And so was there a point where it just stopped and it froze and it held still and just became fixed as something definite and definable and stable and continuous? No, it's just this dynamism. This, And this, again, is so contrary to our conventional view of things. But again, we can feel experience and it re reveals that very perspective to us of its absolute um, transient nature. You can't grasp hold of it. It just slips away just like that, just like that. The idea of things holding still and enduring over time and not releasing and not letting go is just that. It's an idea. It's a concept. It is not how experience actually is. This moment, as the Tibetans say, it's, it releases itself upon arising, the self-release of phenomena. This moment just left. It's gone. It just released itself. This thought. It's incredible to feel that sense of the absolute pure freshness of every instant. The novelty of every instant. The way in which from this perspective that I'm speaking about, there's no history. There's no back, back story. Where is the back story? It's there as an idea, as a memory. But no, it's here right now. It's alive. Where, where is that? Where is the history? So just as I close this little kind of opening, these opening remarks, just for a moment, just feel your own experience. Feel whatever is here. Feel the way in which it's absolutely seamless. F feel that. Feel the way in which there aren't pieces to it, even as it shows up as pieces. It's just an absolutely seamless open whole. It's one life. It is one whole reality, one whole existence. And there's complete fulfillment in this wholeness because there's not one thing looking for something else, not one thing, a self imagining something that's missing that it has to find. No, there's just a single expanse without border, without boundary, without beginning, without end, no pieces, just one sea. clearly making all these what we would call waves of phenomena that are bubble up from the whatever this inconceivable basis of everything is the seed of the foundation if you will of what's here the foundation of each thought that we call thought feeling sensation one foundation you know shining forth as all of this So there's complete 
even though I spoke about how unstable this is, from the perspective of the whole itself, it's completely stable, we could say. There's no, there's not one push, thing pushing against another thing, one, not one thing pulling on another thing, not one thing affecting another thing. And how could there be anything missing from this perspective? and feel the perspective, it's not an idea, it's the felt sense of the seamless, boundaryless nature of this. It's complete well-being. And no phenomenal wave that may appear, all the phenomenal waves that do appear as it's shining forth, never depart from the sea. The waves never depart from the sea. They are always none other than this boundless, seamless sea of existence. And, and so there's no need to try to you know, manipulate or manage or fix the appearances. It would be like trying to do something about the wave to make it be more like the sea when it is already the sea. So changing our experience is completely not necessary. Changing our circumstances. We could still do that, of course. But, but this, this whole doesn't depend upon how it's looking. It remains itself, it remains the whole, whether it's, whether the sea is completely tranquil and calm, relatively free of much waving activity, or whether it's storming like no, nobody's business. It's always being itself, always being itself. Well, that's probably a pretty good uh, launching pad for anything you might like to discuss related to this and explore with me, um, with all of us. Be happy to see where, where this is, what I'm sharing is where you find it landing in yourself and your own understanding, where you might be, if at all, encountering any kind of questions about, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, I don't quite not so sure about this, any sense of, because um, it's all about, it's all about your experience and what your sense of it is. Um, yeah. Well, John, when you were talking, um, talking about the invulner invulnerability mm -hmm. of the seamless, just one mm -hmm thoughts of if someone came after me right now with a knife right and was starting to stab me yeah um with the, this well-being you speak of and i was trying to just um wrap mm -hmm. what you said around an event like that could you speak to that a little bit sure yeah it's a it, it i guess what i would say is it's 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 a matter of perspective always and, and from the perspective of being an embodied creature in a world, there's all sorts of vulnerabilities, including the one you just mentioned, right? Being attacked by, by some other creature or thing or, you know. Um, but, but that is not the whole story of what's going on here. Because if we look at the body and its vulnerability, what is the body? I mean, if we could break it down as a physicist might, and it's not, there's nothing, any, not even anything solid there that we would call material, right? So again, just to stay with that sort of metaphor, if you will, um, as a quantum field of probability, 
it's like th that's what we could say the body of of pam is a quantum a boundless quantum infinite field of probability i mean i don't know enough about physics to speak very knowledgeably about it but we'll go with that for now and then the the attacker is also a quantum field of probability so it's it's like so from a physics standpoint there's no vulnerability either from that perspective so it's kind of like th you could think about this as as a kind of a spectrum of of um a spectrum of if you will of of perspectives uh, on what's going on here and yes from one perspective kind of there's a concrete world and concrete objects in the world and they can crash into each other in all sorts of ways that can you know and and then from this perspective of if you feel into what the body is let's say to come back to the body for a second and look at it experientially not so much a, look at it like an experiential physicist instead of a physical phys physic physicist well what is a body the body is experience, isn't it? Body is not a body. The body is an experience of something that we call body, right? And, and as experience, well, as you know from having explored this stuff on, on your own, that you can't pin down what a body is experientially. It doesn't resolve as being something definite because it's a bottomless infinity experientially feel what's here as what you call body and you come up empty handed. It's not definable. It is not determinable. Interestingly, similar to what physicists would say is that it's indeterminate. It can't be determined what it is at a physical from a physical physicalistic kind of investigation. And experientially, we come up with the same thing. We come up empty handed. So from that particular spectrum, you could say the subtlest of subtlest of subtlest perspectives of what is here, what this is, then there, there is no, there isn't anything there to be damaged. That's the notion of emptiness. There's not a thing there. There's a, there's no saying what it is. It's nothing, but a nothing that is more a presence rather than an absence. More a fullness rather than a, an emptiness. And yet it's a presence and a fullness that also can't be found as a discrete, identifiable, definable, resolvable thing either. So that, that's very curious. And again, you talk about contrary 180 degrees to what we conventionally think of, it's like, and when I say invulnerability, it sounds like complete bullshit. And, and your question, you know, reflects like, what are you talking about? It's like someone comes in here. And so it's important. And I, you know, I always emphasize this, that the other perspective has its own validity and life can be experienced from that other perspective. And much of the time is that we feel like body bound creatures in, in a world, don't we? But it's kind of like, you know, I think I've used this illustration before as well. Like from one perspective, it's like I'm John and, and you're Pam. And I have a kind of individual, independent existence that is not the same as your individual independent existence, right? You're a, a manifested wave of reality that's distinct from the manifested wave of reality that is John. And so from that perspective, again, that conventional sort of reality view, we're separate creatures. There's a boundary, you know, Pam comes to a definitive end, then there's space, and then John begins, right? But from the perspective I'm talking about, that's not, actually doesn't hold water. It doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Feel what's here. And do you find Pam and John, or do you find a field of experience without any boundary anywhere? So which one is it? Is there separate, separable things or is there inseparability? Well, in a way, reality is neither and both. It's ultimately beyond all descriptions and distinctions and characterizations. I'm just introducing 
this kind of radical perspective, radical in the sense of both getting to the root of things. What is this fundamentally? What is this primal nature of this, which can't really be said, but also radical in the sense of more colloquially speaking, it radically deviates from our con conventional understanding of, of how things work in the world. So if you go back to the, the ocean wave metaphor, you know, I could look out at the sea and it looks like one wave crashing into another wave, right? No question about it. But from the perspective of the sea, no such thing is happening. There's just a sea. The, 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 the waves have no independent existence, actually. So as from that perspective, there, is, there are no waves. And there is no crashing. And it can't really be said what, what, what is left <laughs> if there's no waves and there's no crashing. <laughs> but we could say there's just a wholeness without boundary or edge or limit. And that's needless to say a very different reality. It feels different. It feels complete and whole and lacking nothing and invulnerable and indestructible. And another thing you said, um, something about changing our experience. You said, well, we could still do that. Mm -hmm. And so my question would be, who is this we that could do that? I mean, I mean, in the ultimate sense, it's the same, it's the same basis that is the basis of everything that's doing everything. So in that sense, reality, if we're speaking absolutely, you know, the absolute reality, the ocean of existence is doing all of this. It is all of this. And so it can, it can change. It can, it can do all these things that we think of as the things that human beings do. They're being done somehow. You know, there's a force and a power and that's, in a sense, at the basis of all of this. But I was speaking more in the sense of a human being that, you know, has a life and lives a life and from that perspective. And from that perspective, we say, well, um, Pam. Pam can decide that she wants to have a relationship with this person and maybe not that person because it feels more congruent and more resonant to be in communication more with this person rather than that person, let's say, or to, to, to do this kind of work as opposed to another kind of work. So, but, and, but from the perspective of, of the absolute, you know, vast ocean of existence that's, that is all of this stuff, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't matter in, in the sense that nothing can make the, nothing can bring no experience can bring us closer to the fundamental basis of reality because every experience is the fundamental basis of reality. Like I said, you know, if this wave, if you don't like how this wave feels, you might make a choice to change it into a wave that you prefer, a different kind of circumstance or experience, but it, trying to change the wave to make it into the ocean is a fool's errand because it already is the ocean. So changing it doesn't make it any more the sea. Changing this moment doesn't make this moment any more. I mean, it is already the absolute reality, unbounded absolute reality. So you can't make it, you know. You can't make it be any more than it already is when it is already everything. <laughs> How can you make it more? <laughs> it's already everything. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean we don't have preferences as humans, as human, the human creatures we appear to be, because we, it seems like we do have preferences for certain versions of reality over others, right? It's like an apparent reality. It seems like um, there's the apparent versus what's real. So it appears like there's separate objects and everything, like you said, uh -huh. but reality is 
not. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's all reality and one of the ways reality can appear as, as separate objects. It's one of its ways it, it appears. I mean, clearly. <laughs> But it only appears uh, separate if you conceptualize. You need to, uh, whatever that means. You, <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> it, it, it's this additional step as humans, which mm -hmm. we call conceptualization, that seems to separate things and allow a separate me to interact with a separate world mm -hmm. it's all in the in the world of mind and, and concepts that that description holds mm -hmm. any water what's interesting though is that as true as we could say that is that that it's coming out of interpretation and conceptualization that that there those conceptualizations and interpretations can still be there and it doesn't change the fact of of the indescribable inseparable nature of it and so it doesn't, from my perspective, it doesn't require that we get rid of conceptualization or even stop it at all. We can just... <clears throat> as if we could. As if we could, right? Yeah, I, I never succeeded at that myself. But, <laughs> but we can look and we can see, it seems like we have the capacity to look and see the way in which reality transcends the concepts, even as the concepts may keep being, continue to be generated. So I can see it. It's like, and that's why almost there can be this sense of kind of bouncing around different perspectives. Like I can, I can feel the perspective of I'm separate from all of you. And then I can just shift the kaleidoscope and recognize that I can't find separation anywhere, which is sounds contradictory, but, but it seems like reality is happy, happy to, um, have these seeming contradictions and appear in these kind of seemingly contradictory ways as individual yet undivided, separate but inseparable, describable yet indescribable, limited but unlimited, time bound yet completely beyond time, full of problems and imperfections and yet radically transcending anything we might call a problem or an imperfection. explore the nature of substance, substantive nature, whether it's physical objects or subjective experiences that also seem substantial in certain ways. Like, what are you telling me? Like that fear is there, it's substantial, it's actual. It is, it is substantially present as an actual experience. And yet, like a rainbow, it's substantially appearing as a rainbow. It's like, there's no denying, I see the rainbow. So it's substantive in that sense as a present experience but go to find the rainbow, go looking for the rainbow. And what are you going to find? You won't find a rainbow. Not when you delve into it's what it is. You, you've come up with space. You don't find a rainbow. So it's very, it's very odd. It's very uh, beautifully. So in my experience, that paradox of substantiality and insubstantial, insubstantial nature of this. Um, In a way, this perspective that I'm talking about is kind of discovering just how subtle this is. Just how fine it is when you investigate something that seems gross and concrete and, and then feel, feel, feel the body and you start to come up with, wow, it's so fine. It's so ungraspable. It's so subtle, like what it is. It's as if subtle, 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 beyond subtle, beyond subtle to the point of, is there anything even there? And yet there's still this sense of the presence of something. And yet it's so subtle as to be wholly ungraspable and insubstantial. And, and in that subtlety though, there's a delicious, a deliciousness, a lusciousness, a, 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 it's, it's a joy. It's, a, it's just, you can taste it, taste the subtlety of this, of every moment, even the difficult stuff at its basis is this subtle presence, this subtle radiance, this subtle. You know, words for it, of course, but. <laughs> because
because words aren't subtle. Well, funny enough, they suggest, words suggest that lack of subtlety. But actually, the words themselves, like everything else, are unthinkably subtle. So, so interpretations and language and concepts are, are the unfathomable subtlety beyond subtlety too, aren't they? I mean, what's a word? What's a thought? I mean, what is it actually at its basis? Well, you can't say. It's, in a sense, there, there's nothing but subtlety. You know, I was, I was reflecting on this oh, yesterday, or I don't remember when, about how we hear these words in spiritual traditions about the wholeness and the oneness and the indivisibility, the unitary singular nature of things, right? But what we tend to do, and I think oftentimes the traditions reinforce this, is we go looking for the everything the oneness, the singularity in particulars. We imagine it looks a particular way and feels a particular way, don't we? Which is why we go on a search for it. Because it couldn't be this. <laughs> it's got to be something better than this. It sounds so grand and so great, the singularity. No, it's this. <laughs> it's not a particular phenomena or moment it is all particular phenomena and all particular moments so that's the thing if you want to find the one if you want to find the wholeness well you you're all you're ever doing is finding it in every single particular it's like it's like trying to find the ocean in one of its waves it's the same thing oh no the one that feels good and free and open and undivided no that's not it. The all-inclusive non-dual reality is all-inclusive of every of, of its appearances. And so it's found in all of its appearances. It is all of its appearances. And so you're you're always home. There's nowhere to go to obtain it. There's no losing it or finding it. But it seems like every sentence is a variation of this is not true. Can, can you say what, more what you mean? Ed? In this saying of it, it mm. contradicts itself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so that's why you have to keep talking. <laughs> you keep talking fast enough. You overlook the fact that you're constantly contradicting what you just said and are saying. And right. That, and you know, you're saying the subtlety, everything's subtle, except that's turning subtlety into something. Sure. And, and so, Absolutely. yeah. And so, a lot of the times, the words and the things that I'm saying, you could say, are, are designed to kind of cut through um, perspectives that tend to be very dominant in the consensus reality, right? And so, um, you could think of them as kind of remedial in that sense, but but the, the whatever you know, this is true of sort of any spiritual practice is is kind of should ultimately, in the in the optimal sense, reveal the lack of need for those remedial measures because nothing has to happen for this to be what it is. Buddha said it right: by incomparable enlightenment, I attain not even the least thing. What, what the heck was he talking about? Why all these Buddhist practices if there's nothing to attain? Well, the practices can potentially reveal that, that there's nothing to obtain. And, you know, one might say, well, why does that even matter? If you're saying everything is the same, all experiences are the same one reality, then why have the insight that you're talking about if it's the same as not having the insight? And that's a fair question to ask. And I would say that for the humans that we, you know, experience ourselves as being, um, the recognition of that inseparability and that wholeness, and the fact that nothing is missing, that there aren't things, it's just this seamlessness. Um, the recognition of it, in a sense, allows us to enjoy it. 
enjoy that. It's already the case, but not noticing it, not recognizing it, we may not get to appreciate it in the same way as recognizing it. And that um, for a human is a lovely thing to recognize and appreciate. And that's my sense of it. It's like, you know, you don't have to, it's already a colorful world, right? You don't have to recognize that it's colorful. Who cares? Who gives a shit that you recognize that it's colorful? But when you recognize that it's colorful, you get to appreciate the fact that it's colorful. You get to enjoy that aspect of it. So you don't have to, one doesn't need to recognize that they are the absolute reality because what else could they be? But the more that's recognized, the more one gets to appreciate that and in a sense benefit from its inherently beneficial nature is what I would say. So in that sense, that's partly what motivates me to share what I share because I certainly encounter many people in my walk of life who are making a lot of effort to try to correct the waves of their experience in, our, in order to find well-being, to put it one way. And so I, I find myself compelled often to point out another possibility that there's a well-being that doesn't depend upon how the waves are looking. That's very liberating to discover. It gets us off the wheel of that endless search for something else, something other than what's already here. And what a relief that is to, to get off that wheel and to see that, wow, everything I wanted is already present as this very shining forth, this very moment, this very explosion of life is, is what I've always wanted, what everyone has always wanted. All the openness, all the vitality. Is yeah, that... Go ahead. Um, just these um these hour and a half with you um this expansiveness that happens this the appreciation i mean it's it's very tangible and it's very powerful so you're doing you're doing what you're hoping to do very well it, wow. well that's nice to hear very well, but it, it's very powerful and you know what what's important to remember is that anything could catalyze you know, whether it's something like this or reading something or just a moment that somehow a recognition arises for, for who knows what reason, the power say of a coming together in this way, the real power is what is the power behind everything. That's the real power. And it's important, it's, it's helpful to keep that in mind though, that, um, you know, that, that ultimately in the same way, I was just saying that the practices as I would teach them are designed to reveal th that you don't need the practices. The meetings are designed to ultimately highlight the fact that the, that, that, that sense of that expansive boundless nature of this and the power of that and the beauty of that and the well-being that's intrinsic to that is, is, is still the case the minute we sign off of the meeting, isn't it? It doesn't go anywhere. And that's really, that's key thing to remember. And yes, there can just be a sheer joy in coming together and exploring this in the ways that we do. It's, it's completely joyful to me. I mean, I love it as much as I love anything. Um, but yeah. Is, is that recognition and appreciation, enjoyment, the joy of it is—is is that the Ananda in in Satchidananda, and and if so, um, how does the Sat and the Chit round that out? <laughs> uh, I love I love that 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 word Satchidananda. Um, I was trying to write a song about it a while back, and I have to revisit that because I just I love it. But you know, Sat is uh, as I understand the Sanskrit word is is existence. Um, and so it's ever existent, sat, this always is, it always is, this presence of reality, sat. One of its primary, you could say primal characteristics is, um, is this quality of knowing. So the beingness of this also knows that it is, that's, that's how that's how we know that we are, is that consciousness. So consciousness and beingness are inseparable, aren't they? 
the consciousness is of this moment is the beingness of this moment. The, the existence of this moment is the consciousness of this moment. And that's chit. That's so it's ever existent, sought, ever conscious chit. This is, and this knows that it is, obviously. The knowing is effortless, isn't it? The knowing of this presence that's here. The presence knows. Just like the sun shines. And the recognition of that is, I, I mean, Ananda, I, I don't know exactly how it translates, but yes, it feels like its intrinsic quality is one of well-being, of a kind of joy, that, but one that doesn't have an opposite. It doesn't have an opposite of no joy. <laughs> it's, it's the joy, we could say, that's transcendental joy, the joy that pervades our conventional states of sorrow and joy. It's not a joy that, that looks like what we might think of as joy. It's, it's the joy that this is, the, the joy of this. And somehow, this singularity is inherently beneficial. That's from my perspective. It's intrinsically, its nature is pure benefit. That's what I think Ananda is, the intrinsically beneficial nature of this that is and this that knows that it is. Which is what we are. Which is what we are, which is what everything is. Absolutely. The feeling tone of existence itself is well-being. Feel that now. See if you can sense that. That the very life force with the, what we call life, the felt sense of reality right now. Feel that. What is, it, what is its nature? It's beyond words, ultimately. But it's pure benefit. It's pure well-being. One of my favorite little memes or poems that I ever wrote was called The Well of Being. I think I've read it to you before. You know, drop down deep into the fathomless well of your own being. Feel that. Feel your own being. It's the well of your being, the fathomless, depthless well of your being. That's where the true well-being is, the well-being that doesn't come and go. For it's the very basis of all the coming and going. Can't be taken away. The well of being. That's such an ananda, the well of being. well it implies a depth mm -hmm. sure it implies a kind of spatiality that we could also recognize to be unfindable as well but again it's it's you know at a certain point you're left with poetry to try to evoke something of the nature of this that is beyond <laughs> characterization so whether the words are succeed at evoking that sense of the, the um, un, un indescribable, <laughs> I mean, right? You know, the Tao, de, the Tao Te Ching begins with the Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. And that's, that's the, it's because it's not describable, right? You can't encapsulate it in any word, including depth or Ananda or consciousness or well-being. So, um, and yet, words seem to be sometimes useful as a way of trying to convey something about what can't ultimately be conveyed, if that isn't an incredible paradox. <laughs> and that's certainly my hope that the words that I'm speaking can somehow um, help point consciousness back to something that is ultimately beyond words beyond concepts. And what is also helpful is hearing the sounds of your ocean waves. <laughs> That's just because I'm lucky that I happen to be where I am right now. I could thank my dad's illness for that. <laughs> Bless his heart. Because um, I'm down in LA right now.
This is something I wrote uh, yesterday morning. I'll read it to you. This, and my, one of my favorite words, you know, this. This that's here, whatever it is, this, is unconditioned. It doesn't depend upon us. It doesn't depend upon anything. It doesn't depend upon our actions, our efforts, our doing something in order for it to be what it is. This is present, isn't it? And it's present unconditionally, inexplicably. Its presence doesn't depend upon us noting, noticing the presence of it, does it? This is awake. And it is knowing, this is knowing, and it is knowing in this way without our doing anything to make it this way. It's just extraordinary. It's, 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 this is not dependent upon what we do or don't do. It doesn't depend upon circumstances in order to be what it is. It's clarity, the clarity of this, the openness of this, the luminosity of this, the fullness of this, don't depend upon anything. The light of your consciousness doesn't depend upon you doing something to make it illuminated, does it? Here it is, full-blown illumination of your consciousness. Making visible, if you will, this instant. However the instant is being described, Consciousness illuminating this moment. Reality can't gain or lose its nature, and can, nor can it ever depart from its nature. all the waves of experience, so diverse, all the different flavors of experience. Amazing, isn't it? All these flickers of thought and feeling and sensation, all these waves rising up, every single one of them inseparable from the, the sea. Never leaving the sea, never becoming anything other than the sea. And yet pretending to be all these separate things, interacting and, and act, acting and drama and all this interesting stuff. Indeed. It's quite a show. <laughs> it's quite a show.
Let's feel the deliciousness of that singular, seamless whole. How you can't find an edge, any, any moment that you might define in a certain way as being a state of mind or a sensation or how it's boundless. You can't find the edge of that experience. It just, it just smears into every other seeming piece of the, of the fabric of life. It's very curious. It's like everything is like blending into everything else. And there's not really things blending. There's just this seamlessness that shows up as all this stuff, all these seeming pieces. It's like everything is inside of everything else. All the flavors sort of blended together. And just like in a soup, you know, we can taste the different flavors that, oh, there's salt, you know, there's cayenne, there's pepper, but it's, it's completely blended together at the same time as showing up as discrete and separate, right? It's not like the salt is isolated out from the rest of the soup, and yet it, it will emerge in a moment as a distinctive flavor, won't it? As a piece of the whole soup but actually it's all blended together in one single soup of, of reality. It's very funny how it's both completely inseparable and showing up as separate distinctive phenomena. I mean, you look at two discrete things like sound and sight, the sound of the sea or the sound of wherever your environment sounds in your environment and light completely discrete. And yet you absolutely cannot find a boundary between them at the same time. They're blended together, sound and light. They're part of the singular, seamless whole. You can't find the edges. It's such a, it's such a gorgeous paradox to me. It's just amazing. And we can enjoy both. We can enjoy the seamlessness and we can enjoy the discrete flavors. Why not? Why not enjoy them both to whatever extent we, we find ourselves able to? It's like recognizing the, I think what I mean by that is that recognizing the, the seamless, indivisible, singular nature of this is not suddenly create this like, white mush of, of nothingness. There's still all this sparkling flavorfulness and distinctive textures and right sounds and sights. And it's a magic show of it life. It's such a magic show. I mean, really, it's just, it's mind numbing. It's just, one taste, the taste of this fathomless, bottomless indefinability, the taste of that, the subtle taste of that, and then all these different tastes that it shows up as its flavorfulness, sweet, sour, bitter, happy, sad, clear, confused. <laughs> but all of it made of this one taste.
like just feeling the these last few moments together, just feeling the beingness of everything, the sought of everything, the existence of each flavor, the beingness of every thought, the beingness of every feeling, the beingness of every sensation, the beingness of every memory, of every fantasy, the beingness of a self and the beingness of a world and the beingness of no boundary, just this beingness of everything. Just feel that. That's the presence of everything. We could say that's what's most basic and fundamental about all of the flavors is their presence, their beingness. You can't ever depart from that presence. Where would you go? <laughs> you would just go into some other experience that was present. <laughs> no escaping the presence. And that's freedom. Lovely to be with all of you. Thanks for joining as always. And um, until we meet again, have a beautiful rest of your day and uh, take good care of yourselves. Thanks, John. You're welcome. Thank you so much, John. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John. <laughs>